time for us to end this hierarchy of who has the right to live, who deserves not to suffer. As an indigenous person, the fur trade represents so much more to me than just animal abuse. It re represents cultural genocide. That is fully summarized. There were six or eight in the race party. These kinds of actions are going to be more and more frequent. Every lab in Costa Rica comes from information from inside the lab from someone who works there who thinks of hearing the animals train. But they found the animals stable and healthy, unable to use their arms and legs. No food or medical care. Broken bones. Fingers and toes torn off. Fourteen of the two dozen protesters were blocking the entrance to the lab. That's why the deception is that the animals have been taken to an undisclosed location out of state. We want to tell you to learn the truth. But our government is operating concentration camps for animals. Hello and welcome to Animal Voices. You're listening to CIUT 89.5 FM. I am your host, Lauren Corman. Rob Moore, who is my co-host and co-producer, he is away for the week. He will be back next week. Um, thanks for joining us. And I uh, just wanted to say hello to uh, some of our new listeners who found out about us at the uh, Toronto Vegetarian food fair that happened uh, over the past weekend. It was really wonderful to meet both people who weren't aware of the show before and people who were very familiar and were long-time listeners, so shout out to everybody. Uh, we have uh, two different interviews uh, we're going to be doing today. Uh, we are joined in studio by Dr. Levi Waldron, who just got back from the Arctic. He was away for 54 days, and uh, we wanted to find out more about what it is like to be vegan in the Arctic and what he needed to do to prepare to have that diet when he was in some really, really remote areas. And he was also traveling with people who um, are omnivores and uh, had to do a lot of negotiation around his diet there as well. So we're going to find out about surviving the Arctic as a vegan. And, uh, it was a canoe trip. Oh yeah, it was a canoe trip. So yeah, he was uh, he was tripping with um, a group of how many was it? Six or seven people? Six people. So we're going to hear more about that, and then we're going to at 11:30 hear from the authors of the new book, Vegan Freak: uh, Being Vegan in a Non-Vegan World. And uh, the authors are Bob Torres and Jenna Torres, and they're going to tell us about writing this uh, pretty edgy, um, fun survival guide for people who are vegan or are thinking about going vegan. Uh, it's kind of what would you want to know if you were going to adopt this diet. And I reluctantly use the term lifestyle, but I don't know what else to call it when you're just trying to figure out, you know, what products you're going to use or maybe people you're going to hook up with that um, are like-minded. So it's kind of a book geared for people who are already vegan, but also just people who are curious. So we're going to find out more about the book um, at 11.30. So stay tuned for that. But first, Levi Waldron. So tell us about your trip. Well, where should I start? <laughs> well, tell us about uh, maybe about what inspired you to go on this trip and uh, what experience you had before you left. All right. Well, I um, this is actually my second Arctic canoe trip. Uh, I was there once three years ago, and uh, three of us from the previous trip had decided last fall that, that we were going to go back up again, and we found three more people to round it out to six. And... Uh, I guess a number of things drew me there. Uh, I think probably a big one for me was the adventure because no matter how prepared you are for a trip like that, unexpected things are going to happen. And, and we did end up having to figure out what to do in situations that were totally foreign to us and there was no obvious, you know, right answers about things to do and so the adventure and and the the landscape is really quite startling actually if you've never been there before this trip was 1050 kilometers long and there are no trees anywhere along the trip so uh, right from the start it's this uh, landscape where you can just see for what seems like endless distances and mm -hmm. everything you just see everything on a completely different scale it's I don't know, it takes getting used to understanding how large everything is mm. that you can see. And, you know, when you're up on a little on a little rise, you can see for, I don't know, tens of kilometers um, all around. And the wildlife, uh, it's an area like Plains or, or I guess like the Serengeti where, mm. where the animals... Uh, 
don't hide particularly. There aren't a lot of places to hide, so they're just out in the open. And so some pretty amazing uh, wildlife viewing opportunities. And the canoeing is, is outstanding. I mean, we were able to canoe along this this one river. We were on the Bailey and the back rivers, and we were along them for like 950 kilometers with only seven portages, lots of white water, um, gorgeous, gorgeous, clean crystal clear water and no development or people living along anywhere along the way so it's complete wilderness wow. so there are a lot of draws to going up there and the midnight sun and yeah so and so when did you leave we started our trip well we took the bus i took the bus three and a half days up to Yellowknife and on like june 20th and our trip started june 25th we were flown into the headwaters of the bailey river mm. and uh, there was still quite a bit of ice at that time wow. but and then we finished i think in the end august 16th something like that or 17th and a trip like this, um, because you're not going to be able to get food from anywhere else, it's not like you're going to be able to get out of your canoes at some point and go to a grocery store. Mm. There's a lot of planning involved um, with not only the uh, your gear, but also your food as well. And that's really where the veganism came into play. Tell us a bit about how you prepared to eat a vegan diet with other people that were um, going to be eating vegetarian, what you did to prepare as a vegan for going on a trip like that for 54 days. Yeah, that's right. We, I mean, we couldn't pick up a whole lot of food along the way. I did do some browsing on some local edible uh, wild plants. But, oh, great. Uh, but yeah, our, we brought our food with us. We had about 800 pounds of food that we were carrying, and uh, I was off traveling at the time. And so I wasn't able to take as, as big a role in the menu preparation as I normally would have, uh, but it was in the capable hands of one of the other people on our trip uh, who is a vegetarian. And she was able to, I mean, she basically put, she put together an, a nine-day menu rotation, which was mostly vegan. So I, I think it was made definitely a lot easier by the fact that there were a couple of veget other vegetarians on the trip and that everyone was supportive of the, of the fact that I'm vegan and, and, you know, willing to eat a mostly vegan diet for, yeah. the, for the trip. So, yeah, I, I had uh, some input into the menu and made some suggestions for, you know, how to make some of the meals without uh, any uh, dairy products in them. I think for a lot of people, when... They're in a situation where they're not necessarily surrounded by vegans. A lot of people will ask, well, what do you eat as a vegan? And I think the question is even more pronounced when you're in the Arctic. So what the heck did you eat? <laughs> Let's see. Our breakfast would be either hot cereal, like oatmeal or Red River cereal, or granola. Um, and the other people had had dried milk i had i had a coconut milk powder and how did that work out because i think that that's a was a bit of a sticking point you weren't sure what you were going to have as yeah. a milk substitute yeah. that wouldn't be soy milk as we would buy in a store yeah because we couldn't bring along any any liquids they'd be too heavy uh, i worked out fine so it was just yeah. a coconut powder yeah a coconut powder you'd add water to it and then mix it up and then add it to your yep. cereal yeah okay. Uh, or there were pancakes, and there was a muffin breakfast, which we didn't have muffin tins. It was more like a loaf. Right. Breakfast. <laughs> muffin loaf. <laughs> that sounds good. Yeah. Uh, and there was a bulgur breakfast. And then at lunchtime, uh, it was either crackers or uh, shelf bread that we had brought, like a dense rye or pumpernickel bread, or bannock, which we would make the night before, mm. and have like a fresh, dense bread. And, and on those would be either like a hummus or a black bean dip, which were made before the trip and then dehydrated and then yeah. re rehydrated on the trip. The dehydrator is definitely a friend of you you yeah. and the rest of the trippers, hey? Yeah, I wasn't dehydrating. I didn't. I wasn't around enough, but um, a couple of the people in particular had dehydrators going full time for a couple months before the trip. Wow. So, yeah, they made some outstanding things. And uh, a friend of yours, uh, I think it was Timmy who made mm -hmm. uh, 
tofu jerky for you. Oh, that was Drew. Oh, it was Drew. <laughs> Drew made a whole bunch of tofu jerky that was outstanding. Because when we were at the TVA food fair over the weekend, um, a lot of people were buying these various different types of tofu jerky, and they're really, they're really good. They're super overpackaged, but it's kind of neat to know that it's possible to make this stuff if you have access anyway to a dehydrator, or yeah. I guess even in your stove if you do it on low enough heat. Yep. So he, well, how yeah, did he make cheap. it? I'm going to have to get the, the recipe, recipe from him, but I, I know he liked the stuff better when he didn't freeze it beforehand and hmm. just marinated it for a while and then dried it out. So I'm like, it, was, it was pretty simple. Yeah, because freezing the tofu makes it makes it a much chewier consistency. Yeah. It's a really different yeah. kind of product by the end of it once yeah. you de-thaw it. Yeah. Thaw it, not to de-thaw yeah. it. But he said it was very easy. Like He just had a marinade going. He did a number of different ones. He did like a curry one and a barbecue one. Nice. <laughs> you know, ones. But yeah, that was good. So yeah, that, so then there's lunch and we also had peanut butter and spreads. Um, what else did we have? Oh, we, we had two snacks per day. And then a big dinner. Okay. It was it was we ate a lot. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> we had pretty big appetites. And then dinner there was a shepherd's pie, a couple pastas, a chili, a burrito dinner, lentil barley stew. Mm. There was a vegan mac and cheese. There was a pizza. That was one of the few meals where mine was different from from everyone else's. Mine just didn't have the cheese on it. They're still delicious. Mm-hmm. So, um, did you feel denied at all as a vegan when you were traveling? No. No, <laughs> you didn't. No, right? it, uh, I mean, I, I I felt really fortunate to be with uh, a group of people who were really accommodating and and supportive, and you know, we we also had desserts like probably two out of three nights. Like we had brought a bunch of just. Uh, base baking ingredients, flour, sugar, all those, and we made all sorts of fantastic desserts. Mm. We had cinnamon buns, we had cookies, we had date squares, wow. I can't even remember, and a couple chocolate cakes. And, mm-hmm. so. and so tell us, okay, so here you are, you're, um, you're in the Arctic, you're eating, sounds like fabulous food, but you, you had mentioned to me that when you got back, which is really recently, that you felt a bit... Um, I felt disconnected and lonely for a couple of days just being the only vegan. How did you manage to get around that? What did you do to make yourself feel better about being the odd odd person out? Mm-hmm. Listen to a show of animal voices. Yeah. <laughs> no, seriously, I, I I did do that. And uh, you had a show with you. No, well, no, I actually when I when I got back to civilization, okay, <laughs> and had access to a computer in the archives. Yeah. And, uh, no, I. You had some conversations with people over the course of the fifty-four days, though, about about your politics. Yeah, I had a number of conversations, and those, and actually during the trip, I felt kind of lonely uh, a couple of times. But I, I was able to have good conversations with other people on the trip who, who could sort of uh, empathize from other things in, in their lives. You know, they were around environmentalism or feeling disconnected on other things, and and they're just very uh, empathetic mm-hmm. and just kind people and and they all, you know also didn't think I was a freak and right. <laughs> they thought I was you know making a valid uh, ethical choice in right. being vegan so you went to I think it was Joe Haven and your friend mm-hmm. bought an orange for over two dollars yeah <laughs> and I asked you how it was before so how was that orange that you got to share uh, it was delicious <laughs> yeah I just had one little uh, slice of it so you got to meet some of the people in this Inuit community and uh, yeah. and talk to them about your trip as well how that, was that? that that was really a highlight of my trip so where is where is Joe Haven exactly Joe Haven is is on King William Island, which if roughly if you go over to the eastern portion of of the continent, uh, but still west of Hudson's Bay and go north, that's where we ended our trip. Uh, and then you go across the Simpson Strait, like across the water there to the first island. It's a fairly large island. That's Joe Haven. It's up at I don't know about 68 degrees north. And it's a small community of three or four hundred people. And we only had, because we were late finishing the trip, several days late, because the ice hadn't uh, cleared on the ocean yet, and we were having to wait for a boat to be able to come and pick us up to take us across that strait. 
so we only got to spend like an, an afternoon in Joe Haven, but uh, I met people who had been born and spent part of their childhood along the back river where we had been paddling, and uh, yeah, it was really a highlight for me. It was interesting, like I tend to, you know, normally I I always feel, I don't know, a little bit uncomfortable or sort of aware of... I don't know where animal foods are coming from when I see people eating them, and I never totally felt comfortable seeing that other people eat dairy and such, like on the trip or just, just in general. But um, there I was in a community where the diet is really central around fish and caribou and seal and things like that, and I felt good about it. Yeah. I was like, I felt really happy to see them still able to live at least like partially their their traditional way of life and and yeah seeing the grocery store with all the corporate foods in there costing like really five, five <laughs> times as much as they would right. cost here it was I remember I remember you had talked about that too um you were able to see some pictures from the 1950s I think from yeah. one woman who was really excited to show you yeah. some of the pictures of her family and you were talking about the fur coats mm-hmm. that they were wearing and all the different skins that they were wearing and your experience of seeing those pictures was so radically different than what most people I think would expect from an animal rights or a vegan perspective which I think is something that often vegans, animal rights people will get challenged on is that, you know, are you saying that First Nations communities aren't shouldn't be able to hunt um, or shouldn't be able to clothe themselves for subsistence and it's, uh, I think that your experience and what you had told me yeah. about uh, is just such a clear representation of the exact opposite of what those people would expect, that this felt really good, that this seemed ethically in line with what veganism is about. Yeah, I mean, I enjoyed seeing yeah I enjoyed seeing those pictures so much and I don't know I I just I feel that it's kind of hard to put into words how I feel but whereas I feel terrible about the practices that you know our colonizing society has brought all over the world with factory farming and all this completely exploitive unnecessary use of animals it just seemed like a completely different uh, situation where that's what was necessary for people still is necessary for people to live in that in that area and the suffering that those animals experience which you know i'm sure there still is some when they're killed but is uh, so much less than what a pig in a factory farm is going to go through during their lives. Yeah, and it's just not comparable when you look at yeah. fur farming. No. You know, a mink coat as opposed to, you know, some other wild animal that was killed and then worn <laughs> so people can stay warm. Yeah, I feel like they should be different colors or something. Yeah, <laughs> so people, people can know. Um, Lamia, I wanted to talk to you a little bit too, because you just got back from Australia. Sure did. And you were, see, the library was traveling, and you, I assume, ate fairly vegan when you went. Totally vegan. Yeah, how was that in Australia? Where were you? Um, I was mostly in South Australia and Victoria with a friend for about five weeks, and there it was pretty easy. Like, she's formally vegetarian her partner is a meat eater but they were just like we'll eat vegan while you're here I was there for two months and in the middle of it I took a three week trip and that was a bit more of a challenge but I just brought all my food with me I think the only thing I would have ate that is a dodgy little um, debate in vegan land is honey Mm. to just deal because that was what was around and I was also working with a budget too but it was good. I ate great. And I mean, it was also like Australia. And when I went on the three week trip, I went up to the tropics. So it was like fruit and avocados. And you could just drive up and buy some mandarins and drive yeah. away. It was great from the side of the road. <laughs> so it was a pretty radically and different experience. <laughs> and they have, in Australia, there's not much drip coffee, like to the point where nobody really knows what it is. So even in gas stations and stuff, they have espresso makers and lattes. And everywhere there's soy milk. Mm. So you can get soy lattes from the gas station along the highway. 
sounds pretty luxurious. It was pretty nice. So do you have any um, tips, either of you actually, I wanted <laughs> to find out if you have any tips for people who um, are traveling as vegans. I know, Levi, you would come on and talk about your experience traveling in Guatemala before, and I know this was quite a different experience, but just any ideas for people who are either trippers going to go and do a canoe trip or for people who um, are flying over an ocean and uh, landing down in a different country, what you did to prepare or any ideas you have for people? want to maintain their diet in a different place. I did a little research on, like, restaurants and stuff in the big cities, but I also had the bonus of knowing that I was going to be in a house with my friends, so I could go to a grocery store, la, 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 la. And I did ask. I was like, is soy milk accessible? And she was like, yeah, we drink soy milk. It's everywhere. I think in this day and age, I mean, visiting another, you know, like, Western country, Mm -hmm. colonizer country, it's going to have soy milk and all the... You know, like soy milk. That's what I need to keep a vegan happy, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Levi, I know that you had to do a lot of preparation. So yeah. um, when you had done research initially for this trip, you couldn't really find very much for people who had been in remote areas. Do you think you'll maybe do a zine or something or put information <laughs> out there? What What did you do yeah. to prepare? Well, what advice do you have? I don't know. I think in general for traveling, answering your first question, I, I think what's important is to... You know, if you have ethical beliefs about your diet, to treat them with the respect and importance that you feel like they have. You know, you you don't need to uh, minimize the importance of your own ethical uh, concerns in strange environments. And my experience is that if you're just upfront about it and uh, let people know that they're also respectful of it. And so I think that goes a long ways. And, and if you're just consistent about it, then it's, I don't know, it feels it's easier to just do it every time and et cetera. But as far as um, for a wilderness trip, mm. um, I, I don't think there's any great uh, secrets to it because you can eat a lot of things that just come from the grocery store out on a wilderness canoe trip, like the grains, pastas, cereals, crackers, rye vita crackers, or you can get those rye and pumpernickel breads, which don't need refrigeration. Uh, there were some there were some issues that I know you had to do some experimentation around your soy milk, which we already talked about, so you used a coconut powder. Mm -hmm. You were also looking for a vegan mac and cheese that would work and a gravy that would work. So what did you find? The vegan mac and cheese, yeah, that was a bit of a challenge because all of the recipes that that I had seen involved soy milk. Or tofu. Or tofu. And, yeah, uh, I think actually we could have brought, you can get tofu in Tetra Pak, so that might have been a good thing to do, but then you can't blend it. They require blending, Mm -hmm. so... I don't know because it was actually a friend of mine who found the oh, recipe. Olivia is going to yeah, have to tell us. But shelf. it was it was um, probably primarily nutritional yeast based. It was primarily nutritional yeast that had chopped uh, almonds in it and uh, some spices, and that was about it. I think sometimes when we cooked it, we would add a bit of cashew butter or mm-hmm. an oil to sort of cream it up. Yeah, cashew butter is a really good um, substitute for a lot of uh, vegans who want to make something creamy mm-hmm. that has a pretty mild taste. Mm-hmm. But if uh, if we can convince you, can we get Olivia to give us a recipe and then we'll post it on the website <laughs> for people who are sure. curious about how you would make <laughs> a portable vegan mac and cheese that doesn't involve tofu that's pretty yeah. delicious because you sounded like you really enjoyed that yeah. dish. However, I, I can tell you um, if you're going somewhere with a cold climate, cashew butter is kind of hard to use compared to almond butter and peanut butter stay much more pliable when it's cold. The cashew right. butter kind of became a brick. Okay. <laughs> so if you're but in the Arctic, <laughs> you should probably talk to Levi anyway if you're going to travel in the Arctic as a, yeah, please, as a please vegan. Do. We can <laughs> always get you in contact with him. Um, we have uh, just a few more minutes before we go to our interview with uh, the authors of Vegan Freak Being Vegan in a Non-Vegan World, very new book, um, sort of a survival guide for vegans or wannabe vegans. Um, So we're going to talk to them, but during the the vegetarian festival that happened over the weekend, uh, there was um, a a raffle that we did for um, a dinner for two at Fresen Restaurant as well as a sort of one-shot cooking class. And I wanted to get Levi to pick um, the lucky winner. And uh, if you're listening and you had a friend who maybe won, don't worry, we'll give them a call once we find out who the lucky winner is. So we're going to do that draw 
right okay. now. Can I say, too, while you're yeah. having a little pick through? There's so many people, so many, three for me while I was there, and I was only tabling for three hours, four hours. I was late. Mm-hmm. Um, that's nice. So there was people who came up to the table and were like, blah, 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 I listened to your show and I went vegan. And I was shocked. Mm-hmm. I mean, I was pleased and loved. I was like, lovely. And then this other woman came up and said, my reverend listened to your show and she went vegan. And I was like, that's cool, la, la, la. And it's actually um, the radical reverend who has a show here on CIET. Hmm. Went vegan from listening to our show. Wow, she used yeah she used to do the show right after when we were when we were on that time slot oh, I think cool. on Thursdays yeah 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 that's pretty awesome so yeah the the TVA food fair was lots of fun I have to tell you that it's really amazing for Rob and I and Lamia who um, are here you know pretty much every week uh, to bring you the shows uh, when we hear any feedback so any emails that we get mm-hmm. any feedback about the show is like it's soul food for us totally and it uh, it really keeps us going so i just wanted to say thank you so much for uh for all of your feedback and if you want to write us at any point and give us any feedback about the show we'd love to hear from you and uh the email for this program is animal voices at ciut.fm it's animal voices all one word at ciut.fm and all of our shows um pretty much all of our shows are archived on the website which is animalvoices.ca over to you levi all right. So tell us who we got. So here's the first one. I assume this is for the grand prize. Okay. What was the grand prize? Well, let's go with the dinner for two first. Okay. This is for the dinner for two. Okay. Okay. Here goes. Okay. Dinner for two goes to Debbie Supran. Okay. Great. We will give you a call. Okay. Here comes the next one and what's this one this is for the cooking class um, through urban herbivore which is the uh, sort of lunch version of Fresen. it's the new restaurant in Kensington Market uh, mostly soups and sandwiches and salads I it's delicious been there yet. oh my goodness it's delicious I gotta go and this one goes to Jenny Bross okay great Woo-hoo. So you're going to learn more about cooking with uh, Stephen Gardner's crew. I'm not sure if he's going to be actually doing the cooking classes, but somebody very competent, I'm sure, will be. Um, and that's with Urban Herbivore. And we will give both of these people a call and tell what you about the, the good third news. Prize? What was the third prize? The hat. Oh, oh. the hat. Yeah. Okay. For the Here hat. Let's do the one. hat. Yeah. And the hat goes to Brandon Anderson. Woo! It's a really cute hat. <laughs> I okay. like this. We should do a raffle every week. Okay. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks, everybody, for um, you know donating to the program, buying raffle tickets, because that means that we can advertise um, in uh, various different uh, magazines that we'll be able to put on more events. Each of those tables at the TVA Food Fair costs uh, quite a bit of money, so um, each year we're really glad to have donations so we can put out things like buttons and uh, and the cards, etc., for people to enjoy um, at our table. So thanks again for everybody who stopped by. And we're going to take a short break, and we're going to get Bob and Jenna Torres on, and we're going to find out more about Vegan Freak, the new book, Vegan Freak, Being Vegan in a Non-Vegan World. Hello, and welcome back to Animal Voices. You're listening to CIUT 89.5 FM. I'm going to quickly give you our email address again for people who want to give us feedback about the show or have any ideas for upcoming shows. Our email address is animalvoices at ciut.fm. Our website, which is animalvoices.ca, there's lots of archived um, shows, over 100 shows now online. Um, we are joined today by uh, the authors of the new book, Vegan Freak, Being Vegan in a Non-Vegan World, um, Bob Torres and uh, Jenna Torres. Thanks so much for being on the program today. Oh, thanks, thanks for having us. Yes, thank you for having us. So tell us, tell us about the inspiration um, f- um, for writing this book. Was there nothing out, out there like this before? Um, well, I think what happened was that prior to writing the book, uh, we, had a, we had a blog at veganfreaks.org where we had some people who would come and visit us and talk to us about some of these issues, and we found that um, though there were a lot of things out there, we felt like there weren't enough books out there that kind of spoke to vegans like us. Um, vegans who are young, kind of leftist, and primarily into veganism for reasons of animal liberation. So I think there's a lot of great literature out there, but I feel like there's not a lot of it out there that kind of speaks to, to folks that are in kind of our, our position. So we felt like something like that needed to be done. When I tell people about the name of the book, um, friends of mine who have been vegan for a while and they find out that the book is called Vegan Freak, they always sort of nod or smile knowingly. They're used to that terminology and it resonates with them. Uh, had you both been called vegan freaks at some point? 
We actually have. Um, we found that the term definitely resonates with a lot of people we've met. A lot of people we met in, in Toronto this past weekend um, just absolutely love the title. And it's just because, you know, just by doing one simple thing, even if you're not a, you know, what you might call a freaky person, just by doing the one simple thing of, you know, denying eating animal, animal products, using animal products, then you're, you're the freak. And so we want to sort of reclaim that title. We're, we're a freak and we're proud. Okay. I mean, it's a funny term, but I, I, I mean, I think part of what we're trying to do is to make people kind of chuckle at it and to get people to recognize that in a world meat eaters, you're never going to be completely normal if you're a vegan. And why not embrace that? Because if this is what's freaky, then that's what I want to be. There's um, so much negative press about animal rights people. I think the term animal rights extremism is something that everybody's familiar with, with looking at. So it's, it's interesting to see some of these terms in the, in the vegan and animal rights community get reclaimed. Well, thanks. I wanted to find out um, more. I gave a little bit of a description about who the book is for, but it seems like this book walks a fine line between sort of a very, very intro book for people who don't know necessarily anything about veganism and then people who have been vegan for a really long time. How did you walk that line, and, and who did you intend the book to be for? Well, we had a couple of different audiences for the book, and one is definitely people who are on the verge of considering veganism and maybe needed that extra push. Um, so that's why we provide a lot of the arguments for you know, going vegan um, from an animal rights perspective. Um, but we did have a couple of different audiences. Which is difficult, I imagine, to write for a bunch of different audiences in the same book. It can be. I mean, I, I think one of the things that I just add to what Jenna said is that this is essentially the vegan book that I think we wanted when we became vegan. Um, we had been vegetarians for a very long time, and we had read a lot of the stuff that was out there, but... I felt like, um, as a theoretical vegan, I needed kind of a refresher on some of these things. And what we kind of wanted to do was pull together all this stuff in one place so that people who were right on the border of, of going vegan could actually read all this stuff again, and uh, maybe folks who were just getting into it could get an introduction to some of the literature. So it was a, a hard line to walk, but this is, like I said, essentially the book that we wanted but couldn't find. Right. Um, I like the dedication. Um, you dedicate it to your companion animals and also to, uh, it says for Dan, the original commie vegan freak. <laughs> Tell us about Dan. Who is he and, and what has he meant to you in terms of your transition to a vegan diet? Actually, um, for full-time work, I'm a, I'm a college professor and uh, Dan was a student of mine. And um, when I started working at the, the job I'm at now, um, I was a vegetarian, and Dan would kind of politely ask me questions about veganism. And I, at the time, I thought veganism was a little out there. And over time, having someone like Dan to talk to, who I, I could approach him with honest questions, I could approach him with challenges, having someone like that was really useful for me because it helped me to kind of ask some of these, these questions that I had and some of the issues that I, I, that I was raising. So um, Dan was really important for us in moving into veganism because it showed us that you know, there was a rational process behind it, and uh, he helped introduce some of that rationality. Yeah, I'd like to call him our, our vegan mentor because he was just a, a great inspiration. He reminded us why we became vegetarian in the first place and that if we were really serious about it, we need to make that extra step towards veganism. So you had said, I think it was Bob, you had said that this was the book that you wish that you had had when you went vegan. Um, so, so Bob and Jenna, what did you want to know? What were you, what were you looking for that you didn't have very easy access to when you initially went vegan that you were searching out? Well, part of it was a lot of the practical advice that we couldn't find anywhere. Um, like, you know, where do I go to buy toiletries now? If I, you know, I need some soap, and soap has animal products in it. And now where do I do? Um, especially because we live in a fairly rural area, and it's not easily accessible. Um, so a lot of the practical things, we ended up having to go onto the Internet and finding vegan communities and talking with them and getting a lot of advice. Um, and so we wanted to put all that advice into one place. Also, I mean, I think we wanted, we wanted vegans to realize that they're not alone. I, I, there are, right now there are some vegans who are sitting in some rural locale and they're feeling terrifically alone. And I, I guess I kind of thought of um, this book as kind of a paper-based support network for those folks. Um, the Carol Adams book, uh, Living on Meteors, is really a vital book for me as, as I was transitioning into veganism. Um, but I felt like the book, um, well, not, not a critique of the book, I just felt like the book really wasn't getting out to a lot of you know, a lot of younger audiences, and I felt like we could kind of recast some of our ideas in ways that would be maybe better received by younger folks. Because I feel like th there's some of that, that awareness missing. If I go on the Internet and look at some forums or I talk to other vegans I know, I feel like maybe some of the advice that she has is kind of going unheard from people who are, you know, under 30. 
I think that, yeah, you raised, you raised uh, sort of two major issues. One, I've really been meaning to do a show for a while on um, vegetarians and vegans in rural communities because so often we're so incredibly urban-centered. Uh, so, th- yeah, that's the, that's the first thing um, that I think this book is, is really great for. Um, and secondly, yeah, the sort of the youth audience. I mean, w- one of the things that struck me, I was just, when I first got the book, I was flipping through it, and the, I think it was the, the chapter on going all um, AR hardcore, the hardcore AR chapter. Um, th- there was a lot of swears initially in the first part of that, and I thought uh, this is really not the same thing as opening up a John Robbins book. It just has a very different feel um, to it. It's not uh, what you would expect from uh, from sort of a regular, like a health book or something like that, if you were learning about veganism. Well, yeah, and uh, I'm kind of glad to hear that because in a lot of ways we've been influenced. I, I kind of grew up in punk culture in a way. And I mean that in kind of the, the old school punk culture way, not in the kind of the Blink-182 way. Right. And um, I kind of drew a lot from that as as I wrote this book. And I think, um, like I said, I think there's like a youthful vegetarian culture out there. And I don't think there are that many books that tap into it. I think Herbivore Magazine is one of those things that does maybe tap into it. Right. They were kind of a big influence for us. And I think like Sarah Kramer's work and Issa Chandra Moskowitz, who's coming out with a new book soon. Uh, I think these these folks are tapping into it, but I felt like we needed kind of a you know, living among meteors for our generation. I was thinking about how your book falls into a trend that I've been noticing in veganism in general, which is you're mentioning herbivore and uh, and these various different places. It's like third wave veganism or something, right? You know, it's sort of like, a, yeah, it's a it's a more of a hip version of, um, or sort of a new take on some of uh, these old issues. Um, so tell us about what um, you can find in the book. There's sort of those advice sections, but there's also these practical sections that Jenna had mention, you know, where do you get soap? Um, tell us maybe one or two things, uh, pieces of advice or your favorite toothpaste that is vegan, um, <laughs> things like that for maybe as, as teasers for people um, interested in the book. Well, I think um, maybe one of my favorite chapters is, is entitled Hell is Other People, um, and that's the, the Carol Adams kind of influence chapter um, on, you know, just how to deal with your, your crazy family members and people you have to talk to every day. Um, so we, we, we repeat the mantra throughout the chapter is um, make vegans suffer and just to make your wishes known but to do it in a way that you don't have your, your, your family totally turned off by you, um, you know, when you have to sit down to eat dinner with them. Yeah, you, um, you mentioned shyness over and over again, that shyness will not serve you as a vegan. It's really tough for people. I know that I really didn't like being at restaurants, for example, when I first started out and saying, and being the annoying, the annoying person that says, you know, is, does this have dairy in it or, or whatnot. And I think Herbivore Magazine, they have a button uh, that they put out that's something about, um, something about embracing your, your uh, vegan asshole, uh, your inner vegan asshole, uh, because that's really what it feels like um, when you're kind of bothering people and getting kind of finicky about things. But, so you talk about shyness. What, what, do you have advice for people? who are just shy and trying to figure out ways of being vegan but not but not necessarily put themselves out there? Is there a way around it? Um, well, I'm typically a rather shy person, and um, I think people think you have to be confrontational, and they, they don't want to be confrontational, but if you just say, I just don't want to eat X, Y, and Z, and really explain to people that veganism isn't just, you know, meat, it's, you know, I don't want to eat mayonnaise, and just... You know, explain to people with that um, make your needs known, um, and that a lot of people will accept. And they might ask you a few questions and just say, you know, well, I'd, li- I'd like to talk to you about this after dinner, perhaps. So you're not in such a uh, confrontational situation. Mm. Sometimes I think confrontation is appropriate. I mean, I we tried to walk a line in this book when we were writing it between um, not really putting down radical action because on, on occasion I think actually radical action is quite appropriate. But I think radical action may not be the most appropriate thing at the dinner table. Right. Um, I think you've got to walk that fine line between kind of your activism in your, in your daily life. And it's hard to walk sometimes, especially when you look at media representations that play out vegans as either terrorists or hippies or complete fools. Mm. And so I, I think that um, we've got to be mindful of the idea that one vegan is usually assumed to represent every other vegan in the entire world. And this is kind of dangerous because we never assume that one media represents every other media. Uh, and so I think we have to be mindful of that as vegans, and I think in our personal relationships we have to take care in that way. These are really good pieces of advice. Um, I'm just wanted to back up for a second and ask you uh, to clarify what you mean by radical action. <laughs> That's a really tricky line to walk, um, particularly you know sitting here in the United States when the Patriot Act come down quite hard on me for even saying uh, the Animal Liberation Front, for example. 
Um, I think that um, any movement, and I, I hate to get you know completely scholarly here, but I'm kind of a ground machine at heart. You know, I believe that movements need to be fought on a variety of fronts. So I think that there's an appropriate place in, in the movement for um, very gentle outreach for farm sanctuary type work, and I think there's a place in the movement for groups like the Animal Liberation Front. And you sort of touch on some of those in the book as well, or do you sort of leave that for other people to address? Well, you leave most of that for other people to address. Um, I think as far as we would go in the book is, is our second chapter, which is called In Which We Get All AR On You. Right. And I think that's an important chapter for a lot of vegans, because I think some of us tend to forget kind of the, the rational and um, ethical theoretical sides of why it is that we're vegan. And so I, that was actually one of my favorite chapters in the book and one of my favorite chapters to write, because I really uh, enjoy talking about this theory, and I think it's something that makes a lot of sense. I think it's something that if vegans um, read up on very thoroughly, we could actually make really rational arguments about why it is that we're vegan. So what are some of the responses then that you've gotten from the book now? You've tried to talk to a variety of different audiences. Do you feel like you've been successful in your in your mission with Vegan Freak? Uh, we've got a lot of positive feedback, um, and even from longtime vegans. Uh, we've heard from people, you know, send us email um, that I, well, I've been vegan for a few years now, but I really like this book because it reminded me why I became vegan and of all those things that they might not even have known when they became vegan. So that was really great for me to hear because that was one of our audiences actually, not necessarily people becoming vegan, but who are already vegan. And uh, we just did a talk this past weekend at the Toronto Vegetarian Food Fair, which is an amazing event. I mean, I'm sure everybody in Toronto knows that. And we have really good feedback from, from the talk that we did there based on the book. People, we had kind of a, a cross-section of ages and a cross-section of interest, and, and people seem to respond very positively to talks. So I feel like we've um, actually found a niche in a good way, and um, we have some forums online, and we're getting a bunch of different people from all over, pretty much all over the world. And one of the challenges that we're finding, actually, is distributing the book in other countries. We've got U.K. distribution, but man, Canadian distribution has been a challenge for mm-hmm. us. But that's, that's one of the things is I feel like we're really hitting a nice cross-section of folks from across the world, not just in North America. I'm trying to imagine eight years ago when I went vegan and having this book in my hands and not having to sort of stumble my way through things and hook up with people who knew about the ins and the outs of, um, of veganism. For example, you talk in the book about vegan beers and you talk about um, vegan condoms, which is uh, something that a lot of people don't know, uh, that a lot of condoms aren't vegan and a lot of alcohol isn't vegan either. And you have a section here called Don't Read This Section If You're Under 18. So maybe you uh, maybe you bring pe- people into the book uh, uh, just by the fact that you told them not to read a chapter. Uh, well, that's pretty funny because when I gave a copy of the book to my mom, um, in the acknowledgments, I asked my mom and dad not to read the section on sex toys because I don't want my parents to... Uh, I, I just don't want to put those two things together ever, you know? Right. Um, and that's the first thing, of course, that she turned to because she's kind of country, and I get my contrary nature from her. Right. So, so, you, yeah. have, so you have a section on, on vegan sex toys. Uh-huh, yeah. Well, we thought it was important to talk about this because there's, some, there's certainly vendors out there who are ready to sell... Um, vegan sex toys and, and vegan leather and things like that, uh, or pleather, and uh, people wonder about these things. I mean, it's part of the practical aspects of being vegan, and if you want to live through your commitment, we felt like these were important things to touch on. I'm uh, sitting here, I have uh, beside me, um, this is a link to your pleather comment you just made. I'm sitting here with a queen bee bag, which I really, really love. It's a great little bag, and uh, a friend of mine, I don't think she would buy anything by queen bee because she feels uncomfortable often with buying synthetic goods. And I know that there's a lot of synthetics that you mention in the book as alternatives for people. And this leads into a question I wanted to ask you about in terms of how do you, as vegans, um, how do you create an ethics uh, that feels good for you, but it is also, um, that is also inclusive of thinking about other issues like environmentalism, for example. You know, is PVC the answer? What, how do you guys position yourself in relationship to some of those sort of more nitty-gritty debates? Well, that was actually one of the challenges in giving advice in this book because being vegan opens you up to realizing a lot of how, just in general, how things are made that you use and you eat. For example, the sweatshop issue, we uh, mentioned uh, that you can buy a lot of vegan shoes that pay less, but they're not necessarily great in terms of human rights because they're probably made in sweatshops. So you really have to walk a fine line. Well, something could be vegan, but it's not necessarily friendly for the environment, not necessarily friendly for uh, human labor. So you really have to decide, I think, what is important for you. <laughs> for, uh, um, for us, it was just getting out there that there are a lot of vegan goods available, and once you learn where they're available, well, then you can maybe learn where there's more fair trade available, that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, another aspect of that also, I, I think, um, 
I think it's important to consider the common roots of, of oppression as they work, not only through through labor, you know, as, as they also work through animal oppression. Um, and I think it's really important to recognize that stuff. But on the other hand, for some folks who are vegan, there's also a class privilege question that sometimes buying responsibly produced goods is rather expensive. So uh, that was one of my concerns about going into it. I didn't want someone to think that the only option was to buy synthetics or things like that. So um, I don't know. It's a very complicated and, and difficult issue, and we've talked to people about it, and you could go around on it for, for a very long time. As, as I was typing up the press release yesterday, I was thinking, wow, they used the word vegan three times in the title of the book. That's pretty amazing. <laughs> um, but, yeah, you've been able to focus in really um, sort of, yeah, very much so on, on veganism. And you don't bring in a lot of other issues, you know, about feminism or animal rights and, you know, various different issues and how they tie into veganism. Were you tempted to stray, especially as both of you academics um, and activists, uh, to stray into bringing in other social justice issues more to the fore in this book? Yeah, that was a real. It was really challenging not to do that. I mean, in a sense, we do talk about capitalism in in the book and how we need to look at capitalism as perhaps one of the problems in oppression of both humans and animals. Or um, that was kind of a challenge for us not to go further in that. But we needed to. I think we wanted to keep the page number down so we can make the book very affordable. And uh, I think we do provide some some hints in those directions so that if someone wanted to read more in that way, we could they could do that pretty easily. I'm curious, as just we're getting towards the end of the interview, time always goes by really fast. So what what do you um, say to people about why you went vegan and what keeps you vegan now? That's a really big question, and I hope that both of you can answer it. Well, we have our long vegan stories in, in our book, but um, part of the inspiration for me becoming vegan was... Um, we got a puppy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and we had a cat, and we, got, we saw the two together, and just taking care of the dog and the cat together and looking at their personalities made me really connect with animals a lot more and made me realize that all the other animals are, you know, just as capable of feeling. And if I wouldn't eat my dog, why would I eat a cow or a pig? And it, they really helped me make the connection um, to other animals. For me, it was... Um it was that as well, but also um, a question of the fact that as an academic, I read a lot of theory, and I don't like academics that read theory and don't do any practice, right? So I was reading all this theory on animal liberation and animal rights, and I came to this point one day where I said to myself, if I'm serious about this, if this is what I really and truly believe and this makes sense to me, what kind of person am I if I don't change my life accordingly? If this is my ethical standpoint, I'm a hypocrite if I don't, if I don't go vegan and you know, it was such a small, stupid little thing that was holding me up. It was cream in my coffee. For the longest time, I couldn't go vegan because I wanted cream in my coffee. And, you know, in retrospect, that looks like the most stupid thing ever. But um, at the time, that was a huge block for me because I'm a complete caffeine addict. Okay. So uh, ethically is the, re- the main reason I'm a vegan. Could you, I guess, imagine when you're writing this book, could you jump back to when you hadn't been vegan or what you hadn't been vegetarian and trying to put yourself in that mindset about what would be most helpful for people to learn about? Well, for me, it was, uh, um, I think that the whole chapter on the animal rights that was put in there is just the, the amazing amount of cruelty that goes into egg production and dairy production. And once people learn about that, I think that is so important for people to understand just what goes on in those industries. And, Bob, what about you? Yeah, um, as I was going vegan, I was actually writing things down and taking a lot of notes. And uh, it was useful to go back and look at that and to try to remember some of the the questions I had as I was going vegan. Um, We don't want to make veganism sound difficult. I think actually going vegan is pretty easy, and one of the critiques of the book was that by focusing on all these little tiny ingredients and the things that are out there, it makes veganism look harder than it really is. Hmm. In a sense, that's not not what we were thinking. We were thinking that um, this could give somebody who was very serious ethically about becoming vegan a lot of advice about how to do it, because these are the questions that, that we had as we were going there. So it wasn't real hard for me to kind of jump back and think through those issues and try to remember all this stuff as, as we were going through it. And you've been able to figure out, um, you've been able to negotiate things with both of your families to make veganism a bit um, easier around the dinner table. You've been able to, because I think it's always interesting when people are in a position to give advice. I'm always curious if it's worked out in their own families and, and uh, negotiating with their friends and family. Has it worked out well? Well, our family, our family still think we're freaks, but mm. <laughs> but they've come around and they understand. I think after reading our book, actually, um, why we are doing what we're doing, and they they accommodate, and they're even buying some vegan cookbooks, and they're they're sort of starting to understand. Yeah, I think that they're really coming around. Um, they have a real appreciation for it, and I think it's taken them some time. I, but I think this is because food is so intimately tied with 
the way that we live is so intimately tied with our culture and with our social situations that it's inevitable that certain that people are going to identify with food and preparing food. So uh, my mother, for example, who loves to prepare lots of food for, for everybody in the family, and we talk about this in the book very mm-hmm. briefly, she felt kind of put out when she couldn't make things or she didn't know what to make. But after a while, she started to buy some cookbooks. She started to learn some recipes. And now I think she's starting to feel like um, that she can she can go back to the role that she knew. So I felt like initially it was a challenge to her role that she identified in. And um, I think once we negotiated that, it really helped. I'm curious about where you both see the animal rights movement going and what you see as some obstacles um, or maybe even some hopes for the future, sort of looking forward. Um, this book seems to respond to a gap in the literature that you've seen. Um, where do you think we're heading right now? I liked earlier when you talked about kind of a third wave. Um, I actually think that there is kind of a, a movement within a movement that's starting to kind of gear up that is addressing some of the, the younger folks out there um, and maybe kind of addressing some of these issues that we addressed in our book. And I, I think it would be useful for the movement to move in that direction, at least in terms of getting people interested in and thinking about, about veganism. But I also think we have kind of a, a difficult road to hoe in some ways. Again, to get back to the whole media representation, it's, it's that – if you look out in the, in the popular media, you, you rarely ever see vegans represented in a positive light, and I think that's something we, we have to fight against because in a lot of ways that perception is sadly reality for some people. If you don't know any other vegans and what you see is a vegan uh, who is actually a complete fool on television, well then, sadly enough, you know, television serves that kind of educational role for some people, and I think we need to fight that. And Jenna, what about you? Where do you think we're heading, and what do you think some of our obstacles are? Um, I think some of the, the biggest obstacles are fighting the, the power of the, the meat and dairy and egg industries. Um, and that I think if a lot more people understood what really went on um, in the industry and, and the stranglehold that they do have, that they'd be more, um, they consider veganism a lot more. Um, so I think we just need to help make connections, um, make people understand what really goes on, and hopefully help make, because there's so many people out there that love their pets to death. Um, and how do we help them, for example, see that other animals have the same kind of feelings? Um, so I think that's one of the, the major obstacles. And I think that, that this whole third wave of the youth culture, like Bob said, and you said, um, is definitely a, a, a great place to start with this. Thanks so much, uh, both of you, for being on the program. I wanted to make sure you can plug where people can get the book. Oh, yeah. Um, veganfreak.com. You can find the book there. I hate to plug Amazon, but I think Amazon.ca has it as well. Okay, great. And I know AK Press has it out when I was doing a search for you guys yesterday. Right, AK just picked it up. That, which is awesome. Thanks so much for writing this book. Thanks for being on the program. Uh, Again, the book is called Vegan Freak, Being Vegan in a Non-Vegan World. And that's by uh, Bob Torres and Jenna Torres. We wish you very uh, much success with your book. And uh, and thanks for coming out to the TVA um, Food Festival. It was awesome to see you both there. Yeah, it was a real pleasure to meet you, and thanks for having us on. Yeah, we had a great time. Thank you. You've been listening to Animal Voices on CIUT 89.5 FM. Thanks to Lamia, who has been teching for us. Thanks to Levi for being in the studio today. I'm your host, Lauren Corman. Uh, Stay tuned for Roadrunner. around his diet there as well. So we're going to find out about surviving the Arctic as a vegan. And uh, it was a canoe trip. Oh, yeah, it was a canoe trip. So, yeah, he was was tripping with um, a group of how many? Was it six or seven people? Six people. So we're going to hear more about that, and then we're going to, at 11.30, hear from the authors of the new book, Vegan Freak, uh, Being Vegan in a Non-Vegan World, and uh, the authors are Bob Torres and Jenna Torres, and they're going to tell us about writing this uh, pretty edgy, um, fun survival guide for people who are vegan or are thinking about going vegan. Uh, It's kind of what would you want to know if you were going to adopt this diet and I reluctantly use the term lifestyle but I don't know what else to call it when you're just trying to figure out you know what products you're going to use or maybe people you're going to hook up with that um, are like-minded so it's kind of a book geared for people who are already vegan but also just people who are curious so we're going to find out more about the book um, at 11:30. so stay tuned for that but first Levi Waldron so tell us about your trip never been there before this trip was 1,050 kilometers long, and there were no trees anywhere along the trip. So uh, right from the start, it's this uh, landscape where you can just see for what seems like endless distances and mm-hmm. everything. You just see everything on a completely different scale. It's 
I don't know, it takes getting used to understanding how large everything is mm. that you can see. And, you know, when you're up on a little on a little rise, you can see for, I don't know, tens of kilometers um, all around. And the wildlife, uh, it's an area like Plains or, or I guess like the Serengeti where, mm. where the animals... Uh, don't hide particularly there aren't a lot of places to hide so they're mm-hmm. just out in the open and so some pretty amazing uh, wildlife viewing opportunities and the canoeing is is outstanding i mean we were able to canoe along this this one river we we're on the bailey in the back well where <laughs> should i start <laughs> well tell us about uh maybe about what inspired you to go on this trip and uh what experience you had before you left all right well i um this is actually my second Arctic canoe trip. Uh, I was there once three years ago, and uh, three of us from the previous trip had decided last fall that, that we were going to go back up again, and we found three more people to round it out to six. And uh, I guess a number of things drew me there. Uh, I think probably a big one for me was the adventure, because no matter how prepared you are for a trip like that, unexpected things are going to happen. And and we did end up having to figure out what to do in situations that were totally foreign to us. And there was no obvious, you know, right answers about things to do. And so the adventure and and the, the landscape is really quite startling, actually, if you... <laughs> Hello and welcome to Animal Voices. You're listening to CIUT 89.5 FM. I am your host, Lauren Corman. Rob Moore, who is my co-host and co-producer, he is away for the week. He will be back next week. Um, Thanks for joining us. And I just wanted to say hello to uh, some of our new listeners who found out about us at the uh, Toronto Vegetarian Food Fair that happened uh, over the past weekend. It was really wonderful to meet both people who weren't aware of the show before and people who were very familiar and we're a long time listener so shout out to everybody uh we have uh, two different interviews uh we're going to be doing today uh we are joined in studio by dr levi waldron who just got back from the arctic he was away for 54 days and uh, we wanted to find out more about what it is like to be vegan in the arctic and what he needed to do to prepare to have that diet when he was in some really really remote areas and he was also traveling with people who um, are omnivores and uh, had to do a lot of negotiation. It's time for us to end this hierarchy of who has the right to live, who deserves not to suffer. As an indigenous person, the fur trade represents so much more to me than just animal abuse. It re- represents cultural genocide. That is fully summarized. There were six or eight in the race of life. And this race is fun. We would not know about the terrible conditions. These kinds of actions are going to be more and more frequent. Every lab in the region comes from information from inside the lab from someone who works there who is sick of hearing the animal train. They found the animal's table's head. I have used their arms and legs. No food or medical care. Broken bones. Fingers and toes. Fourteen of the two dozen protesters were blocking the entrance of the animal. That's why the deception is so the animals have been taken to an under. Location out of state. We want to the truth. But our government is operating in 